This is a piano composition based on the number pi that changed my life. But before I play it, a little backstory. Hello, my name is David, aka a song scout on YouTube, and today is Pi Day, a celebration of how many times a circle's diameter appears in its circumference. To celebrate, I thought I would look back, discuss, and recreate a special video I uploaded just a few months after starting my YouTube channel over nine years ago. Song from Pi. The concept can be explained in two sentences. The melody is created by taking Pi and assigning each digit to a note on the A harmonic minor scale played by the right hand. I then added harmonies with my left hand. And the idea of turning the endless digits of Pi into music is fairly simple. I'm not the first person to have done it on this platform, and I haven't been the last either, but somehow, some way, my version just kind of took off. After 10 million views on my channel and tens of millions more from Facebook re-uploads, appearing on the front page of Reddit and being translated into different languages, broadcast on TV channels across the world and serving as the prompt of a research paper in the University of Toronto, it is almost certainly the single most viewed piece of media I will ever create in my entire life. Which is crazy to wrap my head around because I wrote this song way before I was on YouTube or even the internet itself, back when I was around 12 years old. So this past month, I went on a road trip back to my family's home to dig through old books, magazines, and files buried in their computer's hard drive to retrace my steps in being inspired to create the song, and finally, to record it in much better quality on the original piano I used to write it all those years ago. I even ended up learning a couple brand new things about Pi along the way, so let's get started. When I was a kid, my family's house was kind of electronically sparse. We didn't have a TV, video game consoles, or a computer that was hooked up to the internet until I was a teenager, so I spent my early childhood making my own versions of anything I could read. Books, magazines, newspapers, newspaper comics, and in October of 2004, I first got introduced to the world of Pi when I received this copy of the magazine Muse in the mail that's now falling apart and I've had to tape back together. It had an article about a special literary project project by Mike Keith to rewrite Edgar Allan Poe's famous poem, The Raven, to include the digits of pi in the number of letters in every word. The article described Mike's poem as an example of a mnemonic device, something someone uses to remember things. And in this case, the poem could help you in remembering the digits of pi, of which there were apparently contests held nationally in math classrooms everywhere on Pi Day, March 14th. Contests to remember the digits of pi? That's something little kid me just had to get in on. The article encouraged readers to make their own pi sentences, and I started building off one of the example ones. Wow, I made a great discovery. Pi, hidden close. The words decipher. But there's a lot of unexpected challenges in writing this way. Mike Keith has chronicled these in detail on his website, which is home to not only the full poem, but an entire short story written around it titled Cadea Cadenza that contains several thousand digits of pi. He had to establish special rules to overcome various problems and provide consistency in how he wrote the story. Problem number one. What do you do with zeros? Skipping over them would make it impossible to know where they originally were in pi from the text alone, defeating part of the point of the whole exercise. Mike's solution is to represent zeros with 10-letter words. Problem number two. Pi contains a lot of strings of very short numbers, such as repeating ones and twos. The English language doesn't accommodate sentences like this very easily. Mike's solution? Words longer than 10 letters represent two numbers. 11-letter words are 1-1, one, 12-letter one. words are 1-2. One, There's a whole bunch of other issues Mike had to overcome that I find really interesting to read about, but little kid me never encountered these problems because I didn't have access to the internet to read the full story, so I was limited to knowing the paltry amount of pi digits from the extra of his poem in the article. Little kid me needed more digits! So without the internet, I figured the best way to find more digits of pi was to find a book about pi. And when I searched my local library's catalog, one book came up. The Joy of Pi by David Blattner. The book had what I wanted. One million digits of pi, all I could ever want and more in the teeniest of print all throughout the margins. But it was through the rest of the book that I really first learned about the whimsical history of humanity's fascination with the number. In the very last chapter on pi memorization, Blattner offered a tantalizing suggestion. Perhaps a musician could remember Pi by assigning musical notes to the numbers. I had been playing piano since I was a kid, so perhaps it was destined that this would eventually become my Pi memorization method of choice. But I wasn't directly inspired until 
a few months later when the May 2005 edition of Muse magazine came in the mail with another article by the same author, Ivars Peterson, about mathematical music. The main example it gave was a melody from Pi developed by composer Daniel Camero, who put the numbers 1 through 8 on a complete cycle of the A harmonic minor scale. However, Daniel had also come up with some special rules, like Mike Keith, to handle special circumstances. He decided the digit 0 represented a pause, the digit 9 could either be a pause or a repetition of the previous note, and two repeating digits would be tied together into a longer note. Playing out the rough melody on the piano was when I think it hit me that this could be turned into a memorizable song. But there were a couple things about Daniel's method that I wanted to do differently. First, I found his rules for special circumstances to be a little too convoluted for digit memorization purposes. I wanted things to be neat and simple, one note for every number. So since scales repeat themselves up and down the keyboard, I put zero on the note before the one and nine on the note after the eight. And then I created the melody for my version. This is the exact piece of paper I wrote it all down on at some point in the middle of 2005 or 2006. The second thing I wanted to do differently was to add harmonic context and chord progressions to make parts of the melody easier to remember and to turn it into more of a full-fledged song. I don't know exactly when I first composed the harmony part, but on October 26, 2006, shortly after I turned 12, I found this file as the first record of my harmonized version of the Pi song. I made this on my family's old computer using Finale Print Music 2002. The program just barely opens on Windows 10 and the notation font doesn't load properly, but the playback is still intact. So for me, this is crazy. I hadn't heard this in over a decade. This is what the Pi song originally sounded like to me when I wrote it as a kid. So bit by bit, I memorized the song and then I could retranslate the melody back into numbers in my head. For me at the time, the song actually wasn't super important and just was kind of a means to an end. And so for a couple years, whenever I was in an icebreaker situation in a group setting and the leader asked everybody to tell an interesting fact about themselves, I could say, I know the first 121 digits of pi. And then I could recite them really fast, like 3.141592653. 12 year old me was the epitome of cool, clearly. <laughs> And the Pi song just sat on the computer desk collecting dust. This is an old photo I found of it literally just sitting there. Fast forward five years to 2011, and I was now a junior in high school. And my physics teacher, Mr. Bishop, wanted to throw a party for Pi Day and invited students to bring their own pies. Now, culinary skills were not something I possessed as a teenager, so I thought, hey, why don't I dust off that old Pi song I wrote and bring that to class to show everyone instead? Since the classroom didn't have a piano, I figured I could just record myself playing it and then upload it to my brand new YouTube channel. But I procrastinated and I waited until the last minute the night before and the video ended up turning out like this. Hello, um, first period physics class. For Pi Day, I wanted to um, share with you a song that um, Pi wrote. <laughs> Like that. I don't think that video would have gone viral. <laughs> in fact, I was so shy about how mediocre the video turned out that I never even brought it up in class the next day, and then I immediately went home from school and made it private. I felt like I could do better. So I practiced the piece a bit more, composed and refined the intro, and one week later, I taped my camera to a mini tripod on the top of the piano, wisely obscuring my bowl cut from view this time, and recorded it again, accompanied with facts about Pi that I had just looked up. I then posted the new version version to YouTube, and I never could have imagined at the time just how much it would take off. My shyness with not showing that video to the rest of the class on that first Pi Day was exonerated next year when I had Mr. Bishop again for calculus, and he ended up stumbling across my second version on YouTube in class without even knowing that it was my video. And looking back, I really had an amazing time in his classes. The physics projects he had us do taught me a lot about how to experiment with creating things through trial and error, and in calculus, he encouraged me and the other students to make a short film as the final project of the semester. And his class ended up being the reason that I put the Pi song on the internet. So Mr. Bishop, if you're watching, 
Thank you for being one of the best teachers I ever had and for inspiring creativity in your students. So how did this version of the Pi song go viral? Well, there were a couple major checkpoints. It kind of got started when the popular YouTube remix artist Pogo added it to his favorites in July 2011. And back then your YouTube subscription feed showed you videos that people you were subscribed to had favorited, similar to how your Twitter feed now shows you tweets that people you're following have liked. So that got it up to about 30,000 views. Then in November of 2012, it was posted onto Failblog back when Failblog was one of those go-to sites on the internet when you were bored. That bumped it up to about a quarter of a million. On Pi Day 2014, it was posted on a Russian website and spread on social media throughout Europe, and I was actually able to track it geographically by looking at the YouTube analytics. That eventually bumped it up to about 2 million. In January 2015, it got reposted on Facebook a few times with the biggest one getting over 100,000 shares, and some of those views and shares trickled back to the original version on YouTube, which eventually then bumped it up to 5 million. At this point, I was in college and decided I should redo the video with professional equipment. But then in November of 2017, it wasn't my remade version, but the original version that took off again, this time on YouTube's recommended algorithm, which is how most videos get views today. They don't really go viral, they go recommended. And that ended up doubling the view count to the 10 million it is today. It's been overwhelming at times to see just how far it's spread around the world and the really touching reactions I've received from people. But one of the questions I've also gotten in response is, well, can't you just make a song out of random notes too? Well, yeah, absolutely. In fact, the research paper from the University of Toronto, funnily enough, doesn't really have to do with Pi. Their inspiration was seeing a seemingly random melody turned into music and seeing if they could create an AI that did the same thing. So they trained an AI with an understanding of music theory and all the components of contemporary pop music. And they posted the results on their webpage and this is what they sound like. But I think this topic hits at an important clarification of what it means to make art from Pi. Like for example, if you were going to make a painting of Pi, how would you do it? In its purest form, a visual representation of the essence of Pi would be probably just the circle itself. But various artists have taken Pi and its digits as inspiration to create beautiful visual works of art. I love seeing the different interpretations people have come up with and learning how they came up with them. And I think it's the same way with music. When putting together this video, I wanted to be able to properly shout out Daniel Camaro for being the original inspiration for me creating the song. And although he doesn't really have a presence on the internet, I found on one website that he did end up actually creating a whole harmonized song out of his set of rules for the Pi melody as well. And it sounds completely different from what I came up with. Which I find to be super cool. There's a ton of amazing examples of music from the digits of Pi on the internet. And I'm going to do a whole follow-up video to this one, analyzing the different techniques musicians have used. But in the end, what does making Pi music mean to me? Is it just another tool for memorization? Is it just a prompt for harmonic exercise? Well, after all the additional research I did about Pi for this video, here's what I've been struck with. At this point in time, we're basically drowning in riches with knowledge about the universe we live in. I read story after story of mathematicians pouring blood, sweat, and tears, dedicating literal decades of their lives to doing tedious calculations by hand and thinking up incrementally more efficient algorithms to push the knowledge of digits of pi ever so slightly forward. And the crazy thing is you only need about six digits of pi for pretty much any engineering project on Earth. NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, even for its most precise calculations for interplanetary space travel, only uses 16 digits. To calculate the size of the universe down to a length of a single atom, you need 40 digits. Anything beyond that kind of has no immediate practical purpose except for testing algorithms and computation speeds. And yet, humans have done it anyway. Why? Because we're curious. We want to know the secrets of how things work. And as a result, Pi has inspired countless careers in mathematics and various different breakthroughs. To me, curiosity leading to unexpected discoveries that enrich our lives is one of the core things that makes us human. The 121 digits of Pi I used in my song weren't available for 96% of recorded human history. So it's kind of an incredible privilege even to be able to use them. With every subsequent number as I hear it representing in a way the human spirit to dive ever deeper into understanding the world around us. So that brings me to my final re-recording. Although I was happy with the quality of the studio version, I wanted to be able to play it one last time on the piano I grew up with, accompanied by sheet music, which I've now made completely free in the description. And there was a little twist to how I wanted to present accompanying Pi Facts this time. So here it is.